Lord, we are <clears throat> subjects of thy pity, of thy compassion this morning. <clears throat> we do not even know what to ask of thee. For we perhaps do not really know our truest need. We think we know sometimes. There are things which are very real to us as needs. But, Lord, it is true, thou knowest all the truest need of our hearts, and only thou knowest. According to thy knowledge, speak, Lord, make it personal, make it individual, as well as collective, that while Eli did not hear the voice of the Lord, even in the tabernacle, there was one who did pick us out for speaking this morning. Thou didst call Samuel. Samuel, may we be called by name. May we know the Lord is speaking to us. Do not allow our minds and thoughts to be diverted onto other people. We shall say that's something for them. But do keep it directly. That afterward we can truly say the Lord has spoken to me. Now for all that is needed, Lord, in us and for us, for this, do that by the wisdom and the power and the grace of thy Holy Spirit. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> uh, by now, I think you know that there is a book in the New Testament which is called the Letter to the Hebrews. Perhaps you think you know something about that. I'm going to read again. We are getting very near to the end of this time of gathering, ministry, I feel that it's very necessary for things to become very definite, concrete, and that we should at this time expect the Lord to be focusing things on very clearly defined issues. But once again, let us read at the beginning of this letter, chapter 1, God, God, <clears throat> having of old time spoken unto the fathers in the prophets by divers portions, and in diverse manners, hath at the end of these days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the effulgence of his glory, 
the very image of his substance and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had made purification of sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high chapter 12 I trust that it has not lost its music verse 18 ye are not come unto a mount that might be touched verse 22 but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem when you go away from this convocation I wonder what you are going to say about the ministry and the messages. Brother Hong, well, his subject was the overcomer. Brother Bromke, well, I don't know I can put it into a phrase. We know what he has been leading us to the other man well his subject was Zion is that what you're going to say the Lord be merciful to you I could almost wish that we forgot that word Zion as such if it represents a subject look through Zion because you see what we have in the beginning of this letter God has spoken in Zion no, through Zion has spoken in his son if we have used the Old Testament name which is always a type and a symbol if we have used it to help us by gathering up all the historical associations of that name in the old let us still remember it belongs to the not as to a name and as to a place and as to a thing a mountain and so forth it belongs to the not what belongs to the but is what lies behind that name its spiritual value, its spiritual meaning, its spiritual essence and if we were asked what is that we've got to come back and answer God has spoken in his son what is beyond, behind, through Zion is his son. He's spoken in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. God has spoken. How has he at the end of those times now spoken 
the speaking of God from a certain point in history unto the end is in his son. Is it necessary to walk around there saying not about his son? Not the teaching doctrine of Christ but the person in the person he has spoken in a person you try to get hold of that it's in Christ that God speaks in him uh, let us try to break that up for a few minutes see Zion if you're going to use the word the name again Zion is in representation the fullness of Christ that is what this letter is about fullness and finality in Christ and Zion as a name represents that the fullness of God's Son that is Zion and that fullness is God's speech for and in this dispensation God's speech is the fullness that is in his son now you remember when you go back to the beginning of the Old Testament and God has intervened in the history of this earth in what is called the creation it all begins with that word God in the beginning God in the beginning God and then what God spake God said let light be and so on God spoke God spoke and out of his speaking everything came you come over to your New Testament and although it is not so arranged chronologically quite for good heavenly reason the Holy Spirit's wisdom the Gospel of John really does stand at the beginning because the other three begin on this earth in history Bethlehem or in case of Mark the beginning of the ministry of Jesus but John overleaps all time goes right back to the deepless beginning and he opens with this in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh here in this new beginning of a new creation of a new order the that er era God speaks the word we have heard something this week about the Logos or Logos I am not trying to add certainly not to improve but I'm going to say a little more about that which the word there as you know in the beginning was the Logos the Logos was with God the Logos was God 
and the Logos became flesh, tabernacled among us. Beginning with the Logos. John has taken that word, of course, from the Greek, which in the Greek world had its own particular meaning. First of all, in the Greek mind, the word logos meant a thought. A thought. Something in the mind. That's where it begins. A thought. Or if you like to make it general, thought. Logos is first of all thought or a thought. Then, keeping to the Greek, it is the expression of the thought. The thought put into expression, maybe words. But what is in the mind expressed, given expression? That's the content of Logos. It might go beyond that in the Greek, but in the Bible it certainly does. It is true, Logos, the word, was a divine thought. Something in the mind of God first, before ever there was expression or utterance. Something that was the mind of God. You say in the beginning, in the beginning was the mind, the thought of God. What a large world that door opens up, doesn't it? We've got the whole of our New Testament there, the mind and thought of God behind everything else. But then, that mind and thought of God was expressed, given expression. God said, out of his thought, out of his mind, God said. Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians, God who commanded light to shine in darkness has shined into our heart. God said by expression, by expression. What happened? Ah, that's the point. That's the word. You see, follow me closely. I'm going to perhaps be exacting on you for concentration for a little while. When God expresses his mind, it is not something just in language, in verbiage, in diction. Whenever God spoke and whenever God speaks, something happens. God speaking, according to the Bible, is always an act. He spake and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The word of the Lord is an act. In this letter, you come to chapter 4, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to dividing asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Go on. God's word is an act. It's a fiat. Something happens. God thought put into expression resolves itself into something that wasn't before. You can never be the same after God has spoken. Even if you refuse it, resist it, that's been a crisis. So Jesus will say, the words that I speak unto you, they should judge you. They should judge you in the last day don't believe in me, the words that I speak, you'll have to meet those in the last day because this is something 
not just said, but something put into the universe, which is a crisis. The Word of God is a crisis. The Word of God is an act. But that does not exhaust the word logos as used by John and as the word of God in the Bible. There's a third aspect, the third aspect to the word. It's the thought, the mind, the mindedness of God. It's the expression of God by which something happens. It's the act of God. But then the third aspect of Logos is its person. It takes up its residence in a person. It becomes personal. In other words, it becomes incarnate. The mind of God, the expression of God, is incarnate. It is in a person. Any encounter with Jesus Christ is a crisis. Any encounter with Jesus Christ is meeting God. God was in Christ. It's an encounter with God. It's not just what Jesus says although that of course is the expression of the mind of God in words but you see it's a personal encounter that has to be not an encounter with what is written in the first place not an encounter with words though they be divinely inspired words it's an encounter with a person so the word became flesh incarnate Shall we go over again? The incarnation of the divine thought in a practical issue in history, in an act, in a fiat. Ask Saul of Tarsus whether his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus road was a fear. Whole dispensation answers that very loudly. It was an act of the incarnate and glorified Word of God. This is the Logos. God hath spoken in his Son who is then the embodiment of his mind who is the expression of that mind who is the incarnation of that mind and this whole letter so called to the Hebrews or to Hebrews is just an analyzing of that or a summing up of that God speaking God speaking in the Bible in his son God speaking in his son and all that follows that from chapter 1 at its beginning right through to the end is just the shall we call it the exposition of God speaking in his son you must read the letter in the light of that, God is speaking. So when you come to chapter 12, this section, from verse 22 onward, what have you? You have the gathering up. The gathering up of that speaking of God in his Son and concentrating it. And if you break up the section, you'll see it's a concentration of what is true about the person of the Lord Jesus and you must look at Zion like that it begins there we are come to where we say Zion the heavenly Jerusalem city of the living God no that 
symbolic language. We are come to the Son of God in all this meaning. All that follows, which I'm not going even to touch upon. I know you would like me to talk to you about the spirit of just men made perfect. What does that mean? And uh, the great company of angels in festal array, you'd like to know something about that? Perhaps you'd like to know a little more about the church of the firstborn ones, whose names are in road in heaven. I'm not going to touch on any of that. I'm keeping here this morning, God speaking in his Son. The thought, the thought of God expressed, the thought of God incarnate, personified. So that Zion, as a typical word or name, is the embodiment of all that. God speaks, or in the Old Testament, God spoke in Zion. He spoke out of Zion. You go through the Psalms and you go through Isaiah's prophecies, especially the last chapters of those prophecies. I refer to them again perhaps presently. You go through and see how God is speaking out of Zion. It even comes to this, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. God speaks out of Zion, in other words, out of his Son hath spoken in his Son. Now, having stated that, that's the position. And you see, I'm trying at the end of this ministry to become focused, concentrate, get the real heart of all this. Now, what is the heart of all this? According to the statement at the beginning, God at the end of those times, in these times, in this time, has spoken how, how, Sunwise in his son. The absence in the original of the definite article, his son, it doesn't make any difference because the very next statement is who he appointed. There of all things. So it, this son is his son. We note that and pass on. The governing law of God's speaking is sonship. Is sonship. That is the thing which governs God in all his speaking. You getting it? Sonship. And as has already been said, Sonship is not a beginning thing, it is a final thing. It is an ultimate thing. Romans 8 again, waiting for our adoption. The manifestation of the sons. The end which governs all God's speaking in Christ is sonship. You like to change the word, it's adoption. It's put at the end. Sonship, adoption. An end, an object toward which God is moving by the speaking in his Son. By birth we are children. By adoption we are sons remembering the difference in conception. Someone holding a little baby yesterday, not of the family or even of the same race, said, you see, I have adopted her. Oh no, that won't do here. 
that won't do here. That is not the scriptural conception of adoption. As you've been told, and ought to know by now, the scriptural meaning of adoption is someone already in the family by birth, who has grown to maturity. And then the day of maturity, coming of age, the celebration, the festivity, the coming of age day, when the father takes his own child, now mature, puts the toga on him, invests him with the symbols and insignia of authority to be as the father in this world. Everyone meeting that adopted son has to reckon with the father. He is, in effect, the father. He has been adopted, or the word really in Hebrews is placed. Placed. In this position of responsibility because of maturity. We have to come back to that from another standpoint as we go on. What I'm saying is, that is the end to which God is working. His beginning is begetting. His beginning is birth from above. Bringing in a family. But mark you, it's not easy to marshal all this into a good order that you can get a hold of, but I think you'll pick it up as we go along. Even in the born child, there is the spirit of adoption. The adoption has not come yet, but there is the spirit of adoption. That's what Paul says in Galatians. Because we have the spirit of adoption, we cry, Abba, Father, I think once here I told you what that really means. What does Abba mean? Why put the two things together? Is it just two words of different languages? Abba is one language, Father another. Is it this uh, matter of super irrigation? What is it? Oh no. Abba is the quality not the relationship, is the quality of a child, a little child. And when a little child turns to its father and says, Dear Father, you've got Abba. It's a heart relationship, Abba, dear Father. It's very, something very close, very intimate. It's a mark of spiritual infancy. Of course, that's the first thing we lisp, isn't it? When we're really born from above, we don't say, as we need to pray, Almighty, most terrible and fearful God. <laughs> Our first list is now, Father. That's the beginning of the Christian life. We have the spirit of adoption, although we haven't come to the adoption yet. That's coming. If the spirit of adoption develops us for adoption. That's the whole course of the spiritual life, you see. Well, that's all here. I'm saying that the, the final object toward which God, the Holy Spirit, is working is what is called adoption. Sonship. It is governing everything. It is governing everything the end which is brought to him bear upon the whole course. What is God doing? Well Hebrews will tell you won't you? That all the discipline all the discipline of the child of God, the children of God is governed by this one object sonship. So you have my son 
despise not thou the chastening of the Lord for whom the Lord loveth his children he chasteneth he disciplines he scourges every son to be set by him to be placed the discipline of the Christian life and what what child or what potential son is he who has no discipline whom the father chasteneth not The, the writer uses a very strong word as you know about such they're not true sons they're illegitimate children come into a false position if they be without discipline there's a tremendous revolt against discipline in this world throwing off of authority and all control all government, all discipline, revolt against it everywhere, especially in youth. Well, the word says that's how it's going to be at the end. Disobedience to parents and so on. This doesn't all go well, does it, for God's final purpose of a family, not of infants, but of grown sons for eternal responsibility now we're back with brother Carl eternal responsibility governmental position in the kingdom in the ages to come There's so much about that in the New Testament that is Ephesians really isn't it? discipline for that dealings of God with us in this way, this way oh look again if you want this illustrated, look again to the history of Zion what a disciplined thing Zion was, wasn't it God was having no nonsense with Zion God was tolerating nothing less than his full thought in Zion when Zion deprived him of what he had brought Zion into being for he then set Zion aside showed that he had no longer interest in that as a thing he disciplined Zion read again your Psalms read again the prophets we're all concerned as we shall show with Zion what discipline what is it? through the years and finally the 70 years of exile and captivity what discipline of the people of Zion shall we just look for a moment at Isaiah I did say a little while ago you look at the the last chapters of Isaiah and you'll find that they are all concerned with Zion these final chapters let's look at are we chapter 61 oh we're in very near the end aren't we of Isaiah when we come to 61 what is it or you can go to 60 if you like arise shine for thy light is come glory of the Lord is risen upon thee but go to 61 spirit of the Lord God is upon me Lord hath anointed me you know again it's the twofold interpretation Zion is here pointing on to the other one who used these very words and apply them to himself now 62 cut out the numbers 61, 62 chapter division artificial for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace for Jerusalem's sake 
I will not rest until her. Yes, all right, righteousness. Remember? You're amplified. Until her right standing with God. Until her right standing with God go forth as brightness. And her salvation as a lamp that burneth. The nations shall see thy right standing with God. All the kings thy glory. I will not hold my peace until that happens. This is the cry, the prophet. And you can go on in these last chapters of Isaiah if you like. Perhaps we shouldn't spend too much time with that. But there it is. And what I'm going to come to in that very connection is this, that Zion, Zion was the burden, the concern, the heartbreak of the prophets. Prophetic ministry always focuses upon Zion. You got that? It's not only the Old Testament prophets. That's pointing to something else. The work of true prophetic ministry relates to this divine thought that is enshrined in this word Zion as we have it in the letter to the Hebrews. To have this amongst the nations, this expression of the fullness of Christ in sonship in a corporate body, that is the end toward which God is working and carrying out all his work of discipline. I do want to apply this in practical way. You see, we, rightly so, perhaps, perhaps rightly so, are concerned with the work, what we call the Lord's work, concerned with evangelism, getting souls saved. Nothing wrong with that. That's all right. Don't think I'm undervaluing that. The work of preaching and teaching and having meetings and conferences and all that we can comfort by this word or phrase, the work of the Lord. We are concerned about that. Very much concerned about it. Perhaps you ministers are very much concerned about your ministry. That is, the next address that you're going to give. And you're filling up your notebooks now. <laughs> You've got a congregation in view. The work of ministry, of evangelism, or whatever else may come within that term, the work of the Lord. Perhaps you ask very much more than anything else concerned with that. You must be in the work. You must be given to the work. And my brother is going to forgive me because I say I'm trying to focus this thing right down. We have been having something in these evenings that I consider to be the very essence of the Lord's interest. It's the same thing that I'm talking about, only in other language, the overcomer. The essence of the divine thought and intention in Zion. Brother Kong has been laid on his back for many weeks. And we should not have got that if he hadn't been. And some of us know that the Lord sometimes sees it is far more economical to take us out of the work than to keep us in it. To lay us aside from all our busyness for him to get the essence of things. 
He's after the essential, the intrinsic. Men are after the big. Pragmatism governs so much of Christian work. But you don't know what I mean by that word. It means if a thing is successful, then it's right. That's shallow thinking. The devil has got a lot of success. Is he right? Many things are apparently very successful. Growing, increasing. Everybody says, my, that's the thing. Is it? That's pragmatism. If a thing is successful and popular and everybody is flocking to it, it must be right. All right. Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, they flocked. They followed. He told why. Told why. He said, because you did eat of the loaves and fishes. Because if you saw the signs and wonders and the wicked and adulterous generation seek it after signs. And they flock for that. But, but, short life. Short life. Presently they're all for seeking. They're being sifted out. He's being left alone. All the marks of success are being withdrawn from this world standpoint. At last, is this a successful movement with him hanging on the cross? Is that pragmatic? Well, we know today, we know today, no, no, not that, not because people are flocking here or there, crowding, rushing, not because a thing seems to be gaining much ground, becoming big, not necessarily. Wait for that. Wait through the tribulation and then you'll get a great multitude which no man can number, but that's not pragmatic in this earthly sense. Do you see what I mean? The discipline, the discipline of being sifted down from the husks to the kernel, from the chaff to the wheat, and wheat corn is bruised, says prophet Isaiah. Wheat corn is bruised, is bruised. He's after the true, genuine bread. And the constitution of that is something that has been ground to powder, been bruised. Does this explain something to you, your own history? It's very true, it's the word, you see. Therefore, there is this section in Hebrews about sonship, the chastening of the Lord chastening the Lord and chastening for every one of us may be, mean something different what would be chastening to you would not be to me but what would be chastening to me would be to you you can get away with lots of things but the Lord knows where to find you out for you can't get away I might be able to force myself through some things on sheer natural soul force. I don't know whether that's true now, but I might be. Perhaps in the past it's been true. But the Lord knows just how to chasten me. And that, that is chastening for me and perhaps for no one else. That thing. Oh, don't just bring that word chastening into a narrow definition. It's the thing that gets us individually, finds us out. Thing which to me is real discipline. There's some nice, very patient, 
forbearing, long-suffering temperaments, you know. And they can be spoken to and treated and they don't ruffle a bit, they just go on. But with someone else, the Lord brings a rather awkward person into the home. And my word, that person is disciplined. You see what I mean? Chastening discipline is what it means to us individually. But whatever that is, and you may, may say, well, why does the Lord do this with me? Look, he doesn't do that with all these other people. They're getting away with it. Until I went into the house of the Lord. Saw things from his standpoint. The Lord is dealing with me and letting off all these other people in that way, but he's got me. Do I revolt and say, it isn't fair? The law is not fair. He doesn't do this with other people. He doesn't. Oh no, this won't do. He is focusing upon this end, this sonship matter for adoption for eternal responsibility. Well, get hold of that and we'll go on. With Zion again in the background of our thought, let us pick out one more thing about Zion. I expect you well know, of course you do, commonplace, that in the very blood and constitution of a true Israelite, a true Hebrew, a true Jew, in the very constitution and blood, there is a consciousness or sense of destiny. We are the chosen people. And we are chosen for God's purpose and intention. It isn't something that we have taken on as an ideology, as a philosophy of our existence. It's in our blood. They can't get away from it. It is themselves, isn't it? It's like that. A true, true citizen and child of Zion has this this inwrought sense and consciousness of destiny. It is the reason, the, the, the ground, why they've been able to suffer so much. Why they could go through their persecutions and survive. Why they could endure so much. It's, it's not because they make up their minds. Not just the strength of their will. It's something born in them part of their very being it's elemental to them that they are a people of destiny they hold on to it they cling to it they're still at the wailing wall it's born out of this alright well that belongs to the not here we are with the but we have come to Zion and we have come to Zion in this sense. There is, by right, if it is a true citizenship in heaven, this one was born there. If it is a true child of God, there is something about such a true child of God that although they may not define it, they may not know even the scriptures about it, within them they have this sense of destiny. That there's some purpose governing our salvation. There's some meaning beyond our present comprehension for which we have been called. There is something 
in us, in our very constitution, that says, Paul, according to his purpose. A sense of destiny. This is essential to Zion. This is what the New Testament is all about, and this is what this letter to the Hebrews is all about. This is true sonship. We don't like this, these ideas, we don't like this language. But you see, with the Jews, the Jews, the true Jews, there was this element in them of selectiveness. You don't like that language, do you? Brother Con got very near it last night, but he didn't use the language. Selective. Something separate, something different, something other, something not general but particular. The inward consciousness are being called and chosen for something which we call destiny. And only that will keep us going through the discipline. Only that will keep us going through the suffering, the adversity, the perplexity. Have you not been, as I have, more than once and more than twice at the point where you would have despaired been left to yourself, you would have given up and gone out, taken another way, and even washed your hands of Christianity. You've never been pressed. Well, if you haven't, all right, thank the Lord, but there is such pressure, you know. And even this man, with all his wonderful experience and knowledge of the Lord, came to a point where he said, I was pressed out of measure. I despaired of life. Paul, you despair. And you're always telling people not to despair. You were writing about the God of hope, and you tell me you despaired? And you tell, tell people to be in the ascendant on top, and you say, I was pressed beyond my measure? Yes, all right. Yeah. Perhaps you don't know all that, you know a little of it. But the children of Zion are kept by something. They're held by something. It's this indefinable something which we call destiny. There's, there's a hold on us that won't let us go. There's a grip upon us that even when we say we're going, we can't go. Even when we come to the depths of despondency, we don't go out after all. We don't, that's all. We decided to, but we don't. No, it's not something to analyze and put into a system of teaching, doctrine, but it's some deep reality that is holding us. We are children of destiny. The call according to his purpose. Oh, I would like you, if you want a little Bible study, to go through and underline that word according. According. According as. According to. Marvelous word that is. With Paul. It's all according to something. Zion was elect, chosen, separated, made distinct because of destiny, its great purpose. And there was that in its very constitution, in the very blood, in the very blood, a sense of something beyond unto which we have been called. Now I'm coming back to the prophets, you see. The prophets were supremely concerned with Zion. 
just because of Zion's destiny. Oh, how burdened they were about Zion. And of course, in their case, their burden and their concern for Zion was the recovery of Zion. Zion had lost out. Zion had ceased to be what it was called to be, what God intended. It had lost. Now the prophets are all concerned with the recovery of Zion and Zion's testimony. That's prophetic ministry. That could open up another hour or two, couldn't it? Oh, prophetic ministry. What do you mean? Foretelling. Foretelling events, all right, if you like to have that, you can. But the real essence of prophetic ministry is the recovery of the fullness of Jesus Christ, which has been lost. It's a recovery and a reinstating of the testimony of Jesus in the church. Well, that's our evenings, isn't it? That's true prophetic ministry. And don't bring prophetic ministry down to this and that and something else. The gift of prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy? What is the gift of prophecy? only foretelling, it may be that or it may never be that at all and still be the gift of prophecy. The gift, the function, the anointing of prophecy is the recovery of the full testimony of Jesus. The recovery of all that Zion means as the fullness of Christ. And any ministry that does not have that as its objective, clear and strong and definite, is not prophetic ministry. The prophets were thus burdened. Read Isaiah 43 again. In the light of that, which we haven't time to do. Well, now we come to near the end for this morning again then Zion is the embodiment of the spiritual values of Jesus Christ underline that word spiritual values test everything test everything by the spiritual values not from the standpoint of pragmatism at all from the standpoint of its spiritual which means its eternal value the ministry of any brother my own or anyone else is not going to be judged by the, me- the number of conventions or meetings at which I speak and the amount of Bible teaching that I give or he gives is never going to be judged by that understand that you may have your diaries full of engagements preaching engagements you may be on the way you're a very very busy Bible teacher you say in America what is it? teach the Bible you teach the Bible you may be very busy and you may have no time or anything else and yet with all the sum total it's not going to be judged dear friends by how much you've done in that way it's going to be judged by its eternal spiritual value what the essential spiritual value is when this life is gone when I'm gone when you're gone when all the teachers are gone and we arrive in heaven and discover what was taken up then in our lifetime and is there the things which are seen are temporal in the preachers and the teachers and the conferences the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal 
And that's the standpoint of Zion, the, the essential spiritual value of everything. Now you, dear preachers, teachers, really burdened in heart that every bit of your ministry shall have a spiritual eternal value not the address not the address great teacher principal of a theological college but a real man of God to his students put it this way do not be concerned with the winning of your sermon but be concerned with the winning of the people meaning of course their spiritual life no it isn't whether my address is successful accepted or not it is what is the spiritual lasting value from an eternity's and heaven's standpoint of anything and surely our ambition ought to be that when it's all over here when it's all over there are no more conferences down here no more ministries and addresses down here and we all gather above our ambition is to find their people who say look here I wouldn't be here but for what the Lord did in me through your ministry that's it isn't it oh focus upon that for Zion is let me repeat the embodiment of spiritual value not a place not a sect not anything temporal that's not Zion now it is the concentrated and intrinsic spiritual values of Jesus Christ that is Zion hmm. on what note shall I finish this morning well with all that in view of course the right note of course would be God's jealousy for Zion prophets shared the jealousy of God over Zion the Lord said I am jealous for Zion for Jerusalem I am returned with great wrath and great jealousy where is God's heart set? not on any temporal expression of the old Zion that's not God's jealousy, God's concern, God's wrath relates to the true intrinsic spiritual values of his son Jesus Christ. He's focused upon that. He will look after those spiritual values look after the spiritual values that ought to comfort comfort us who minister especially see people may repudiate may discredit and may go away and leave us alright that's discipline it's pretty hard but wait a while perhaps in their own lifetime they'll come back or they'll confess and hear I got something from you which has been my real salvation I didn't recognize it at the time but I know now that what you were saying what you were doing was the thing which has become my my deliverance my salvation in the time of trouble or it's like that God will look after the spiritual values if you are concerned more with spiritual values than building up something big down here that is where his jealousy is sooner or later his wrath will be shown from 
Zion in that sense, the enemies will have to bow. They'll have to surrender. As in the eternity, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. All the enemies of Christ are going to be very much humbled. God is going to roar out of Zion. But let us be quite sure that it's Zion in this sense. Ye are come to that to Zion. And leave it there for now. The Lord interpret. Pray. We do pray that, Lord, this very hour may be used by Thee to produce those essential eternal values. Not just be an hour with ministry more or less appreciated. But there may be something wrought, something planted, something put inside us constitutionally that shall appear in heaven and in glory as the divine fiat, the word, the word of God which did something. So help us. Seal this time then in that way, forgiving all mistakes and errors and faults in the human take charge of thine own interest for thy name's sake. Amen.